Welcome back to The Mining Pod. Today on the show, I'm joined by longtime Bitcoin miner, Ben Gagnon, Chief Mining Officer at BitFarms. Ben and I discuss Core Scientific's bankruptcy warning, BitFarms energy strategy, and treasury management. Ben, welcome to The Mining Pod. Thank you so much for joining me today. Saw you just two weeks ago on the Bitcoin Mining Council conversation there, which was great with Michael Saylor. Uh, some interesting numbers for Q2 or Q3, I should say. Uh, so it's great to see you again. How you been? Yeah, great to uh, be on your show and uh, doing pretty well. I'm coming at you from Washington right now. So I'm here for the week um, on site. We just had an open house at our facility out here a couple of days ago, and I'm still out here looking at optimizations and, uh, you know, opportunities in the area. Nice. Yeah, I did see that a bunch of people are going up there. I think at least one person from Compass was on that tour. They were pretty hyped about it. They're telling me about it. Um, but let's do a little intro. I think most people in the mining space know know you, but maybe some people on this podcast audience don't. So we'll do a little intro. And then we got to talk about core. Like there's no way we cannot talk about core after the huge news yesterday. So give it to you first for the intro. Sure. Uh, my name is Ben Gagnon. I'm the chief mining officer for BitFarms. Uh, BitFarms is one of the largest and oldest publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies in the world. Uh, we have somewhere between about 1.6 and 2% of the network, uh, depending on how big the network is today. Uh, we've been operating since 2017, and we have 10 different facilities in four different countries right now, uh, powering the Bitcoin network and, and helping to secure everyone's Bitcoin. Uh, I've been in Bitcoin since 2015 full time as a miner and in Bitcoin as a hodler since 2014. So, uh, long time in this space and a uh, long time miner now, going on seven years, coming up on eight. Okay, let's talk about Core. We got to do it. Core Scientific put out that notice yesterday that they uh, are not able to pay some financing for October in November. The largest miner in North America by hash rate with about 30x of hash online, about split evenly between self hosted and self mining or hosted and self mining, I should say. That sent big shockwaves through the mining industry and then the Bitcoin industry as well. Their share prices tanked about 80% and they're trading around 30 cents as of now. Any reactions to it? Any thoughts about what this means for the Bitcoin mining industry? Was this expected? Like, I, I expected one miner to pop I and mean, we've seen some private stuff, but. Most people don't know about that. The fact that Bit, that uh, Core Scientific is front and center, right? They're publicly listed, means a lot to to many people in the space. Yeah, I mean the the news about Core, I'm sure, is shocking to a lot of people. They are the largest miner uh, publicly traded by far. Uh, usually, they produce in a month what most people produce in a quarter, right? And so their production figures are just huge. Then they have hosting. Um, that's almost equivalent to you know all of their their own self mining. So they're they're one of the largest players by far and they've been around a long time. I think the the news uh of core is very similar, you know, to my reaction with the news of of Compute North. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of companies going bankrupt right now and having trouble paying their bills. We have the uh the tightest mining economics that we've seen since 2010 and you know, really we didn't have the the kind of you know, efficiencies in, in network hash rate and in Bitcoin price and everything else uh, that we had back there in 2010. So in, in some ways, this is this is a tighter market than it was back then. Or sorry, I mean, 2010, 2020 is, is what I mean. And so, you know, we should be seeing a lot of miners capitulate. Um, really, the, the name of the game in 2021 was growth. And people latched on, especially on the public miner side with this expectation of what is the company going to be at the end of 2022 for hash rate and you know without understanding all the complexities that go into a mining company and trying to properly value all these different companies people really latched on to this end of 2022 year and hash rate number i think that really incentivized people to grow faster than they were than they should have um, it you know, encourage people, incentivize people to sign deals that they probably shouldn't have and take risks, you know, on underlying uh, economics and, and underlying cost of energy and that sort of thing uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise been incentivized to take. So when we see, you know, companies like Core and 
um, Compute North and, and a lot of the, the smaller guys that have gone under, you know, that's a sign to me that the market's doing exactly what the market should be doing. And, you know, the, the people who got a little bit ahead of themselves and, you know, those are the people who are going to be wiped out. Um, you know, for companies like BitFarms, what we've always tried to do is, and when we talked about this at our investor day back in, um, I can't remember if it was June or July, but it was right around the time uh, we had the Luna uh, crash and we had the price fall down to 20K. And we were talking about, you know, how we as a company, we don't control our revenue. Um, we cannot control the amount of, of Bitcoins we get out of our hash rate and we can't control the value of those Bitcoins. What we can do, though, is we can control our costs. And what we know as a company that's been in this business, you know, through multiple bear markets, um, through multiple halvings, is that if, if we focus so tightly on our costs and we make sure that we're in that kind of lower quartile of low cost producers, that even in the worst case scenarios, our low cost position kind of hedges us against the worst case scenarios. And so while we've seen a lot of our competitors go out there and sign power uh, purchase agreements or sign up to buy power without even a power purchase agreement, um, you know, we we didn't do that. Uh, we focused on hydro development specifically. And that hydro development is is great, not only for the sustainable energy aspect of it, but the sustainable economics behind it. There's very little impacts into a hydro power supply chain that's actually going to cause inflation. Uh, basically, these are assets that have been paid for years or decades ago. Uh, really, you just have some labor and some basic maintenance parts, you know, which is nothing compared to a fossil fuel supply chain in terms of of impact. And so, while everybody has seen their costs, you know, go up widely across the industry, our costs have remained flat, um, and that's something that we we positioned ourselves for uh, because we knew that these sort of market pullbacks would happen. So for me, I look at this and I think this is this is the market doing exactly what the market should be doing. Um, it's clearing up the the investment into projects that were not long term economically sustainable. And this is really the light at the end of the tunnel for me is seeing companies that that did grow too fast. I did put more of an importance on growth over cost. Uh, you know, they're 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 going to pay the price for that right now. Um, and so that's the light at the end of the tunnel for me. I think this is a necessary thing that needed to happen before the market can take off again. You brought up a few things that we're going to dive into in this conversation, including hash rate projections, costs, and then treasury management, which three things BitFarms has done very well. And I have a lot of questions on those, but we'll get to them in a second. Last questions on Court Scientific. Where do you think this goes next, heading into the end of Q4, beginning of 2023? Compu North, huge, huge news for the industry. Uh, affect a lot of miners, including Compass. And then now we have a Core Scientific. We're going to see more contagion. Are you expecting like ASIC prices to go fire sale? Is hosting going to become cheaper? Or, like any sort of tailwinds that you're expecting from your position as of right now? Yeah, I think uh, I think hosting is definitely coming down along with the hardware prices. Uh, you know, even for several months, you've been hearing people saying, "Well, hosting prices are are seven to eight cents," um, but I've seen a lot of that capacity just go unfilled, and so. Well, I think there were definitely some people who may have signed contracts at those prices and it left hosters, you know, thinking that they're going to be able to secure those prices. The economics that we have today, you know, seven or eight cents, even if you have the the newest equipment, it's just it's just not worth it. So I don't see why people would take the risk signing a, a one to two year agreement at seven or eight cents, given, you know, there could still be another another leg down in the market. Um, and there still is always going to be rising network hash rate, and there's still always going to be a natural long-term downtrend in revenue per tera hash. So I think hosting is going to come down. I think people's expectations with regards to hosting and counterparties is going to change drastically. And you know that is something that is not really a reset, more of a return to normal. Uh, you know, looking at counterparty risk from a hosting perspective is something that was very, very real risk in the industry for its entire history. Um, and really, it was only in last year when growth was so paramount and all these companies were flooding into the US that it seemed like due diligence just kind of went out the window. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's, that's a problem that will be corrected too. You know, this is the market naturally healing itself. I think hardware prices have pulled back significantly and they'll probably continue to do so. Um, 
but for for the industry rolling forward into next year um you know i think you're going to see a bigger emphasis on on people running their own operations owning their own assets being more vertically integrated and having more certainty on their underlying cost controls because uh we're we're seeing now that you cannot have growth at any cost um growth at any cost is the thing that actually will be your undoing it's not going to be your you know, uh, price to a massive, massive mega market cap for your company, you know, if you can't survive the the bear market. Definitely. And love all the points that you just made. Let's dive into BitFarm's general strategy. You guys have been executing all over the place, whether it be South America, Canada, or Washington, I'm sure a few places in between as well. So let's get like a little elevator pitch on BitFarm's if I can, like where you guys are currently hosting, hash rate online, those sort of things. And then I do want to dig into the details about how you guys have gotten this hash rate online during the last year or so. Yeah. Uh, so you know, BitFarm strategy since the beginning has always been to take advantage of underutilized hydroelectric resources as, as our primary input. And we do that for a couple of reasons. You know, one, there's the sustainability of the, the cleanliness of that resource and the emission side of things. But like I said earlier, it's the sustainability of those economics, which which really makes them quite attractive for miners. And where we look to develop, um, you know, three of our four countries that we're operating in now all have very similar characteristics uh, between Quebec, uh, Washington State, and Paraguay. These are three territories that have huge amounts of hydroelectric infrastructure and generation capacity and water flow relative to local industrial and, and retail demand. And so what that means is that especially in Quebec and Washington, there exists a huge amount of, of excess power production relative to you know large scale products and relative to ability to connect and, and sell to you know other states and other wholesale markets, and there also exists a large number of these kind of uh, smaller industrial sized facilities which have sat empty for for years or decades, and they have that power infrastructure built in. They have the transformers built in. And really, nobody has come in there and, and made good use out of those sites. And so, you know, in our experience, when we were looking in that kind of 10 to 50 megawatt range, there's a lot of this kind of smaller assets, which are sizable, good enough scale for industrial scale Bitcoin mining and making investments and growing a team, but also small enough that, you know, you get some decentralization in your assets um, you get to, you know, build it out on a more reasonable scale without, you know, having too much of a, of a capital concern for the, the size of that project. Um, and we get to take advantage of that infrastructure, which has already been built and, and amortized and paid for, which, um, you know, if you're building out a one gigawatt site brand new, you're not going to have any of those advantages uh, that we talk about. So it saves us a lot in terms of our capital costs. It also allows us to tap into these resources and these energy markets where, we are not competing with other large consumers of electricity, which helps keeps our rate really low um, and stable. And then uh, we're also looking to, you know, spread out and get greater diversity across, a, you know, a wider area. So that's why we expanded out of Canada into the United States and into Paraguay and into Argentina is have a little bit of that geodiversification to, you know, not be so exposed to one party's politics, one party's rules of, of regulations um, you know, one state's environmental impact um, or, you know, kind of environmental conditions, storms, that sort of thing. Um, and that's that's really enabled us to tap into some good markets, build up some teams. And now we've got teams in, in all these areas who are looking to grow out these, these regions further. If you look at the numbers, which we can turn towards next, it, the strategy is working, right? According to our own numbers, which we run through Mining Memo, our newsletter, you guys are the number one miner for the last month and consistently in our top three. And the percentage change between the top three is marginal on every month. So last month, you guys had 4.2 exahash online. You mined 481 Bitcoin last month and you have a hodl of about $43 million cash on hand uh, or Bitcoin equivalents. Uh, again, number one for our rankings for the last month, which is pretty notable. Curious to get your thoughts on that. Uh, yourselves, Hive, and Iris are typically the top three in the pack. When you're looking at the other public miners, how do you sort of position yourselves? How do you guys think about your strategy? Uh, are you guys competitive at all? Or is it more just like focusing on what you guys can do best? 
vertically integrating and finding the cheapest energy. Yeah, I mean, we like to think of ourselves as as the leading operator in the space. Um, we've got a great reputation. I think it is fairly well deserved that we build and we operate some of the best facilities in the space, bar none. And um, you know, and we have open houses and we have tours and we bring people out for site visits. Uh, they're always impressed with how we build, how we operate the teams, the software that we use, you know, the kind of data that we have um, available to us at, at every granular uh, level throughout the entire company. And, and that's how we've always tried to set ourselves apart. Um, now, notably, a lot of our competitors are not strong operators. Um, and that's going to lead to a wide volatility in the underlying economics. And from our perspective, you know, Bitcoin is, is already volatile enough for most investors. Um, what you want to do as a good operator is you want to start smoothing that volatility out, still giving you the exposure that that volatility gives you on the upside, but trying to smooth out some of this unpredictability. Um, so, you know, this is like the reason why we don't run our own mining pool and we, we will never run our own mining pool again is because there's no, there's no real gain for us. You know, even at our scale, um, Basically, we're just going to take underlying volatility risk that the amount of blocks that we find today is the amount of blocks that we should have found today. And, you know, why should I take that risk um, when I can just get a guarantee from from Foundry that they're going to pay me my full paper share at a 0% fee? You know, there's, I'd rather export that risk to a third party for zero cost, right? And, and that's what we that's what we do. If you look at our numbers, anybody who's on Foundry Pool, as long as they're accurately reporting their exahash figures, we should all have the same like Bitcoin per exahash figure. Um, the only reason why you wouldn't have the same number at the end of it, if we're all using the same pool, we're all using the same profit calculation, is one, you overstated uh, your exahash that you're actually running, or two, you you understated how much you actually curtailed or or how high your offline rate is. Right. If if those two things are are adjusted, then that number is going to move down. But if you know if the number is consistent across the top three or whoever many that is, you know that shows that all those people are accurately reporting their exahash figures, right? Because or they're accurately reporting their their average or their curtailment or whatever feeds into that. What I think um, is shaking out now is, is I think there's probably a lot of companies out there who who never thought Ethereum was going to go to proof of stake. I mean, me personally, as a as a Bitcoin maxi, I also never thought Ethereum was going to go to proof of stake. So it was a bet I would have been willing to make as well. Um, but the impact of that is is now playing out. You know, for those companies that had sizable F mining operations, um, the the good thing for them is that it's a very cheap time to be buying new hardware. The bad thing is is that you just you just killed your primary cash cow. Um, you know the the F mining margins consistently at 98 99% mining margins irregardless of you know what hardware that you're running relative to bitcoin mining margins which are a lot thinner so on a on a relative dollar per kilowatt hour you know revenue equivalent you just you just shot your cash cow um or well somebody else shot your cash cow vitalik shot it uh so that will take that will take some adjustment on, on their part and i think that you should expect to see you know, production and revenue figures that have fallen off precipitously, um, you know, with, with that change and with that adjustment that needs to come into place. Uh, and with companies who've, who've raised money prior to this pullback, you know, you're in a great position to expand. Um, I, I think most companies are really just trying to focus on what they can control, which is, you know, costs and um, trying to strengthen balance sheet and liquidity. Definitely. So you've mentioned a few things that I've liked. The the energy strategy is key. And then the pool, you guys aren't taking underlying risk to that, which uh, surprisingly, a, a decent amount of number of miners had to figure that out this year with either moving to blocks here or Mara pool or whatever else. It's interesting that that was a choice. Uh, the third thing you brought up is operational strategy. Be keen to get some thoughts about what that looks like. Uh, more details, I suppose. Like, are you guys hiring people who are in the industry? Do you guys choose to hire people outside the industry and then train them yourselves? Uh, are you guys hiring locally? What sort of an operational front that sets you guys uh, apart from some of the other miners that are also in the top rankings? Yeah, on our operation side of things, you know, it's it's really hard to find people who are already in this space and have experience. Uh, pretty much everybody on our operation team is somebody that we hire locally and we we train in house. And we do have some pretty good 
uh, career opportunities inter- internally because uh, we do a lot of internal promotions to uh, managerial positions and site managers and regional managers and everything else. And so we actually have quite a few uh, young managers uh, within our company, you know, who are, are doing the job that if they were in a traditional industry, it'd be managed by somebody who's probably 45, 50, you know. Um, but here, you know, we've got a lot of people in their their young mid twenties who are taking on these these kind of roles. So we do a lot of local hiring and internal um, training and, and promotion of those employees. Um, yeah, and and you know, we have at this point, I think the last number was 129, maybe a little bit more than that. Employees, uh, most of those employees are in Canada, uh, but we have other employees in in Washington State and and down in South America as well. Gotcha. Okay, let's move over to treasury strategy. I'm pretty interested in this topic, and I think a lot of miners are right now because they have to mine their pocketbook for the first time in quite a while. You guys have had an interesting strategy where I wouldn't say that you guys have really stayed away from capital markets, but you haven't been so laissez-faire to be in a situation where I've seen a few miners who are really trying to either like liquidate machines quickly, dilute investors, or raise capital out for whatever interest rate, you guys have sort of been in between, which has seemed to be a pretty good play. Look at the numbers that we have internally from uh, looking at your guys' public filings. As of July, there was about uh, $43 million in debt payments owed by the end of 2023. Um, and that's as of July. So those have, numbers have obviously changed since then. Um, so looking at the numbers that we have uh, from your public filings, you guys owe about $4.6 million per month in repayments on both the interest and then the principal itself. Uh, it changes every month, of course, either up a little bit or down a little bit, but that's about the figures. And these numbers are pretty close or approximate to what I see a lot of other miners, like pretty normal interest rates, like nothing crazy on that front. But I am curious to know like how you guys think about these debt payments going into a bear market when margins are shrinking, a lot of people are blowing up. How do you guys look at your debt payments right now and think about how you're going to organize them going into possibly a longer bear market? Yeah. I mean, the uh, the capital part of this is incredibly important. I mean, we're in a very capitally intense industry. And really, if, if you're not allocating your capital efficiently in this industry, you, you will die. Um, and so the strategies that you take there are really key. What we did right on the the early set of this when it came to growth was we tapped into a couple of different things that we thought would be a good way to spread out um, our capital across a couple of different strategies and try and balance uh, debt dilution and and have a kind of a more you know, just a balanced approach with that. So we did private placements last year, and we also launched our, our ATM program. Um, the ATM program allows us to uh, really have a much more cost-effective uh, form of selling our shares into the market. Uh, and that program is, is significantly larger uh, than we've actually tapped into. Um, and the reason, you know, for that is, I mean, with with everybody at a ninety three percent pullback. You know that's a it's a very expensive thing to tap into right now, and so that's the dilution aspect is something that we're always trying to be mindful of and um, and be very judicious with, um, and we try and balance that out with the debt as well, right? By doing things like having minor financing. So uh, we did a lot of minor financing programs, which you know, for our perspective, you sign into an agreement that has you know it's only backed by the minor equipment; it has no recourse on the parent company at all. Um, and this is a way for us to free up that capital that's tied up in the machine itself for further growth, um, and also just trying to achieve better ROIs from you know a cash deployment perspective. Uh, financing is a key in terms of reducing our total cash associated with with a new project, and and getting a return on our invested capital quickly. Um, and so we've done a, quite a few of those minor financing programs. We started paying off um, a number of those just because we started doing them at the end of 2020. It's now been two years. Um, we've paid off our first three equipment financings. We've got another two or three that will be paid off uh, within the next three months. I think it's by January or February. We'll have another two of these, maybe three of these um, debt financings paid off. Um, and then we have the the Bitcoin backed loan, and so we've been trying to spread out um, 
our sources of capital across more than one bucket so that we, we do have a more of a balanced approach with that. And I think we've done fairly well uh, with regards to that. Obviously, we could have, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. looking back, would we have, you know, done some things differently? Certainly, we would have made some changes. Um, but, you know, when this market pulls back to the extent that it has down to 20K, that was the the most extreme levels that I think anybody, you know, was really anticipating in this market, maybe even more extreme than than anybody really believed was was possible. And so when you get down to those levels, you have to adjust and you have to do what you need to do in order to make the company long term and, and profitable. And the good thing for us was that we had that strong emphasis on cost controls that I was talked about earlier in the program that, you know, even when the margins uh, pulled back, you know, we are still generating good cash flow out of our mining operations. And so we started doing things like, well, it's very expensive to, um, you know, issue equity at these prices. Let's convert over our, uh, our Bitcoins that we're mining and let's use them to fund OPEX now because the relative cost of doing that on dilution is, is just too great. Right. And so, um, you know, we've really we've really tried to manage all of that well. And I think a lot of our peers right now are, you know, looking at equity markets like, hey, this is going to be our saving grace. You know, this is our time to, um, you know, really tap into these equity markets and take advantage of maybe lower hardware prices or distressed companies. And while there may be some interesting opportunities out there for growth, really, that cost of that equity is the is the most expensive it's been in almost three years. And companies are not going to want to invest in your equity right now without massive, you know, uh, warrant coverage and that sort of thing, which is going to make that cost of capital even higher. Uh, and the reality is, is that growth right now, unless it's very, very strategic and opportunistic is probably a bad idea, right? What you want to do right now is you want to be focusing on, on costs and you want to be focusing on, you know, just implementing the the path forward that's already in front of you with the least amount of risk, the least amount of cost associated with it. And any deviation from that path needs to be really justified, right? Like there needs to be a very, very clear, transparent reason why you're justifying growth, given the worst mining economics in, in almost three years, right? Um Right now, your your emphasis, I think, as a miner, should be focused on balance sheet improvement and liquidity. And second, you know, I would be focused just on on just operational performance and optimizations. Right, there's lots of different things that you can do in your farm right now to to tweak to get better margins. Um, we've been playing around with our our underclocking and making sure that. You know, if mining conditions get even worse, you know, we're ready with underclocking and, and the economics uh, around that so that we know when we underclock at what price point, at what levels in order to achieve maximum profitability. Like those are the things that you can control. Um, those are the things that I think you should be working on. And uh, I would be very, be very wary of somebody going out and doing, you know, a $200 million equity raise at, at these prices. Interesting, because that's, what I've heard from other miners is it's a good time to go and pick people up, right? Go pick up distressed assets, go pick up distressed miners, go pick up distressed companies and incorporate them into your firm. You're saying take the opposite approach, be more conservative here because there could be a long bear market ahead. Well, I, I think the, I, I'm I'm saying take the opposite approach, but for a different reason, I, I'm saying they're distressed assets for a reason. And, um, even if they're distressed, it doesn't mean that I want to necessarily take up these these assets that put these companies into this position, right? Um, just because something's cheap doesn't mean it's profitable, and doesn't mean it's a good addition into my portfolio uh, of of infrastructure and investments, right? So, you know, if if a company is going into distress because they didn't secure their power purchase agreement, you know, for for an example, and their underlying power costs have now gone up, you know, so they're at seven cents. I don't care how cheap this miner is or how cheap this asset is. I don't want to buy something with exposure to seven cents power, right? Um, and so, I, I, if it wasn't in that situation, it probably wouldn't be distressed. And you know, the assets that I want to pick up, the assets that would fit into our um, our requirements. They're not the ones that are going under right now. 
that's fair enough. I like that. I like that approach. Okay, let's talk about future hash rate predictions and then also what BitFarms expects for 2023 as we wrap up here. Believe it or not, we're getting close to holiday season, so it's a good time to do some predictions. Uh, BitFarms expected hash rate. I have it somewhere in my notes, but it's not in front of me. What are you guys expecting for end of year close and then going into next year where some projections for for BitFarms? I think our I think our last guidance on that is still six x a hash, so that's still our guidance. Um, you know what we've done here from our, our corporate perspective, we've almost fully built out uh, the Quebec infrastructure. Uh, that's on schedule to be finished by the end of the year, and all of our Quebec growth plans are pretty much satiated at, at that point. Um, the Washington site's pretty much fully optimized. Paraguay site's fully optimized. The Argentinian site is. Uh, more or less completely built out on the first warehouse. Um, still a little bit of work that needs to be done there, but we're very close to having that built out um, and finished. And so really just about implementation there at the Argentina site uh, through the remainder of the year um, and, and possibly spilling into next year. Uh, but we just focus on what we can do right now, which is controlling our costs and, and filling you know forward the, the remaining construction plan that we have. And other than that, it's, it's about, you know, Strengthen, or strengthening the balance sheet, improving liquidity, um, building up more of cash reserves so that, you know, if there is some real strategic opportunity ahead of us, you know, we're ready to take advantage of it. Uh, I think that's what everybody should be doing right now. Uh, you know, unless they've raised capital at just the right time and didn't deploy it, you know, at just the wrong time, uh, that's probably what you should be doing. I, you know, we look at hash rate growing for the rest of the year, my end of year hash rate target, you know, that I had set at the end of last year, we're, we're way underneath that. Um, I reduced that down um, when we had the Luna pull back to an end of year expectation between 265 and 295 with an estimated ending year figure at 285. Uh, where we are today, uh, I think we're probably going to be below that. Uh, most of my expectations really rely on a USD per terahash figure as opposed to network hash rate. Because what happens with that network hash rate and Bitcoin price, both of those you know figures compound on each other. And what matters to miners in terms of determining whether or not they're going to turn on or off their hash rate is that USD revenue per terahash figure still. Uh, and so, you know, what we look at is we try and understand where uh, miner costs are. And we try and extrapolate kind of a, a general cost curve and determine at what point significant you know, amounts of miners are going to turn off. And that level that I had identified at roughly $0.07, cents, maybe maybe a little bit lower than that. Um, and I've been really happy to see over the last difficulty you know, adjustments that, that that number is right around like $0.6.7, $0.6.8, cents, it seems like, before massive amounts of people turn off. If you watch you know, the difficulty assumption calculators with the Bitcoin price... You actually can see miners adjusting in relative time. You know, if we have a price down that goes from 19.5 to 18k, you'll look at that difficulty calculator, and the amount of expected blocks just starts falling precipitously. And then if you go up to you know the 20 20.5 and 21k, the amount of expected blocks that were behind starts gaining up quite quickly as well. And so miners are watching that level around 6.8 cents very very closely. And I think a lot of people are, are going to be adjusting their their setup accordingly. So I don't think the I don't think the price can go much lower than that, especially before the end of the year. Uh, I think you'd have miners doing underclocking. I think you'd have miners turning off um, in every way, shape, and form. The the real question here is now there exists such a huge amount of hardware and potential hash rate capacity relative to uh, where the Bitcoin price is and where the economics are. Is that you know how how big of a Bitcoin price increase do we need to see before uh, you know mining economics actually materially improve? Because I would expect that even if we have a price increase from twenty k to thirty k, we're not going to see a fifty percent increase in underlying mining economics because there's so much hash rate that's being pulled back, being curtailed, being turned off um, that it, sh- it would absorb all those um, increases in mining economics. So end of year total hash rate, hard to say. I think the floor for revenue is 6.8 cents. Um, and so right now, you know, we're probably going to end up 
maybe 255 to 265 or so if if we're ending the year around you know a similar bitcoin price as we are today one more question for you since you brought it up what do you think happens with this glut of asics just sitting around there's estimates i've seen up to quarter million plus machines just sitting around in boxes is this going to break the economics for companies like bitmain is this going to break minor financing is this just going to lead to like a stagnation in growth as you said well, I think it's already broken a lot of the the minor financing companies. I think, you know, that industry came out of a a real desperate need for people to raise capital with these huge increases in in minor prices, right? That you know, you're paying eighty three dollars a terahash. How the hell are you going to pay for a hundred thousand units? Yeah, you need you need some financing, right? So it came out of this need for for financing with huge prices, and I think what what you know all these companies have learned is that. Unfortunately, the collateral value can fall much faster than anybody you know expected or is used to, um, and so it's going to take some time, I think, before companies figure out a strategy where they're actually protected in the worst case scenarios. Because what we saw in this downturn uh, with Luna is that the minor financing companies were not protected in the worst case scenarios in a lot of their transactions, and so that's not a position they want to be in. I think that the industry is more or less done until they figure that out. And if you do get financing, it's going to be at a much lower, much, much lower LTV and equipment value relative to the collateral. You know, I think you'd be lucky to get a few dollars a terahash, whereas before you were getting $36, $45, $55 a terahash pretty easy on a lot of these contracts. Um, So that's... Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna take some time to shake out. I think the the ASIC oversupply will also take some time to to shake out because the situations and manufacturers are still producing at the same rate that they were producing three months ago, and and they have such a long term supply chain baked in with the foundries that you know it takes them twelve months to adjust, and surely you know they've started pulling back on future production capacity, but we're not going to see the impact of that for probably nine or 12 months from here uh, at the earliest. And so that really means that huge excess of miners existing in hands right now, less incentive to deploy, huge amount of miners still being produced. Um, I think companies like Bitmain are actually in a relatively strong position, um, probably from a balance sheet perspective, but they have so much liabilities in terms of that future production capacity that they're going to be really, really pushing for sales, even if those sales are are marginal at best. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out. But I think you know everything goes in waves here. There's a wave where um, uh, miners are are oversupplied and infrastructure is undersupplied, and then it'll reverse, and infrastructure will be oversupplied and miners will be undersupplied, and then it'll reverse, and it 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 does it. Every single time in this industry, though that oversupply undersupply mismatch will will play out for for all of time, um, and so we're going through that right now. Uh, I think because we're starting to see hardware prices, you know, just fall to the the lowest prices we've seen in in years, and we see people not signing into these hosting agreements, and the price of the hosting is probably going to start to come down. I think we are, you know, kind of in an inflection point in that curve. Um, where we're starting to see the the switch, but um, you know, it's going to take years for this to play out. And I think that there's no reason for anybody to be buying a miner today unless they have a spot to plug it in. You don't want to take the underlying uh, risk involved. Gotcha, Ben from Bit Farms. Thank you so much for joining me today. I think you speak probably the most eloquently. I've had someone on the show talk about mining economics. So it was a pleasure. Right. Thank you. Well. Appreciate that.